Wait lang. Dito. Yes. Rineg? Sige. Kahit mahina yung boses? Nasaan ka? Nandito sa upuan ni Sir...
Good morning. The Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines welcomes you to the remotely piloted aircraft system and flight safety webinar series. First of all, the Regulatory Standards Development Division would like to thank you for your warm reception to our invitation for this webinar. We received an overwhelming number of response, especially for this part. That is why we made this as basic as we can to provide you with the information that are really important and those information that you truly need before you start your RPAS operation. As we accelerate towards the integration of this remotely piloted aircraft system in the Philippine airspace, we should always keep in mind that safety should always remain fundamental. And you, as our new breed of aviators, are welcome in the safety culture of this aviation industry. I am Irish Prashan and I will be your moderator for this webinar series. Our first speaker is Frank Edward Marty. He's the Acting Chief of the Regulatory Standards Department, the Officer in Charge of the Regulatory Standards Development Division of the Flight Standards Inspectorate Service. Frank is an expert in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations and has been giving lectures on RPAS regulations. You will certainly learn a lot from him. Thank you, Attorney Irish. Good morning, everyone. In the next 20 minutes, I will be sharing the fundamental rules and regulations on remotely piloted aircraft system here in the Philippines. These are basic information that one should know before owning a remotely piloted aircraft or before operating a remotely piloted aircraft system, or even before engaging in any activities employing a remotely piloted aircraft system. Well, some of our audience here today may already have the knowledge of these rules and regulations, but for others, it is their first time to hear this. So this presentation will endeavor to provide said information to our prospective and new ARPAS users and acquaint them with the rules and regulations as provided in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations and in Republic Act No. 497 or the Civil Aviation Authority Act of 2008. This presentation also intends to reiterate to our existing operators or users on the rules governing ARPAS. It is imperative for our past users to know these rules for the reason that ignorance of the law excuses no one from compliance therewith. So let us begin by knowing the definition of an RPAS. The International Civil Aviation Organization, or the IKO, defines RPAS as a remotely piloted aircraft, its associated pilot station, the required command and control links, and other components as specified in the type design. This definition is adopted in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations. Be it noted that an RPA is not exactly synonymous to an unmanned aircraft. The RPA is only a subset of an unmanned aircraft. The RPA will be subject to the same equipage and certification requirements as that of unmanned aircraft operating in the airspace. In other words, an RPA acts like and are treated like manned aircraft. Those unmanned aircraft that cannot meet such requirements are dealt with separately. They can be accommodated in airspace, however, with appropriate consideration given to the risk they pose to other aircraft, the people, and the property on the ground. These days, owning a drone is as easy as owning a cellular phone. It is readily available in the market and it is even becoming more affordable. Anyone can purchase it online and in different shops and malls. This is because at present, there is no regulation pertaining to the ownership of drones here in our country. It is widely used in the field of photography, 
videography, land survey and mapping, agriculture, surveillance, and in recreational interest. In recent times, drones are now utilized in cargo delivery services, and it is not far from possible that drones will be used to transport passengers in the near future. Regardless of the size or type of drone, or the nature of its use, the fact that it occupies certain part of our airspace, there has to be rules and regulations equivalent to the risk of its operation. This is because safety is our paramount consideration. For that reason, ARPA's regulations were placed in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations, particularly provisions under Part 2, that is for personal licensing, Part 4, that is for aircraft registration, and Part 11, this is for aerial works or operations. Under the PICAR, there are two general categories of ARPAS operations, commercial and non-commercial operations. It is important to distinguish the type of operation since there are applicable registration, licenses, and certificates that are required for certain type of ARPAS operation. So first, let us look at commercial operations. The operation can be classified or categorized as commercial operation if the use of the ARPAS entails remuneration. Straightforward examples to this are hired professional photographers or videographers using ARPAS during photo shoot or its video shoot. The details and processes involved in obtaining these certificates will be extensively discussed in parts two, three, and four of these webinar series. In addition to the three certificates I mentioned, an RPA with a gross weight of 150 kilograms and above are required to obtain a special certificate of airworthiness or experimental certificate. The reason for this is that, considering the size of these aircraft, the authorities inspectors have to thoroughly examine the technical specification and capability of the aircraft and determine its airworthiness. This is to ensure safety. Now let's move on to non-commercial operations. All ARPAS operations not covered under commercial operation are categorized as non-commercial operation. An example to non-commercial operation is an RPA who, owner who uses the aircraft for recreational activities or simply the hobbyist. The general rule is non-commercial operation or the use of ARPAS for non-commercial operation does not require registration, nor certificates or licenses to operate are necessary from the CAAP. However, notwithstanding the non-commercial use of the RPA, it is encouraged that an ARPAS be duly registered. This is one way of practicing irresponsible RPA ownership. Please take note that the non-registration for non-commercial ARPAS takes some exceptions. And these are, number one, for RPA with a gross weight of seven kilograms and above, and number two, for operations within the controlled or prohibited airspace. In these two instances, the ARPAS to be used must be duly registered. Another rule for this type of operation has something to do with flight limitation. The rule is an RPA controller, even if that person has a controller certificate for as long as it is for non-commercial operation, he or she shall only operate within the visual line of sight. Simply put, he or she can only fly the RPA within the limits of his or her sight. 
Another restriction in non-commercial operations is the prohibition during nighttime. Night operations for non-commercial operations may only be allowed in exceptional cases, and this requires a specific special permit to operate to be obtained from the authority. So, after having discussed the specific guidelines for commercial and non-commercial operations, now I will tackle the general ARPAS operation restrictions and limitations. This is applicable to both commercial and non-commercial operations. First restriction, ARPAS operation is not allowed within 10 kilometers from any aerodrome reference point or airport. The main reason for this is to avoid any possible interference with the airport operations. Further, integrating ARPAS operations in the airspace utilized by airplanes flying in and out of the airport would put at risk the safety and lives of hundreds of passengers on board of such aircraft. Though there are some ARPAS operating within this circumference, these operations have special clearances from the Air Traffic Service and from the Flight Standards Inspectorate Service. Second limitation is the operation of ARPAS that should not be more than 400 feet above ground level. This is because at this height, manned aircraft are already hovering and are operating. Third, Operating an ARPAS is also prohibited in populous area. This is mainly to ensure the safety and security of persons in such area. Several reports reach the authority that there are sightings of drones flying over subdivisions and in residential areas. These pose risk not only to the safety of the residents, but also threat to their privacy and security. Lastly, ARPAS operations is not allowed in controlled and prohibited places, such as in Malacanian, military camps and bases, and the like. Understandably, this is for security purposes for our vital government installations. There are several complaints and reports with respect to drones or ARPAS incidents that were received by the authorities. These reports are being acted upon and are duly investigated by a dedicated investigating body. While there are no specific provisions in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations on the penalties in cases of infractions or violations of the regulations, Section 82, however, of Republic Act 9497 provides the general penalties for violations of any issuances or regulations promulgated by the authority. And as provided in this particular se uh, section, the fine ranging from 20,000 to 100,000 pesos is imposed for every violation. In coordination with national and local government authorities, the CAAP undertakes to intensify the enforcement of these regulations. So um, that covers all the fundamental regulations on our pass. And with that, this ends my presentation. For further information, you may visit our website at www.cap.gov.ph. The complete text of the PCAR provisions on our pass and other related materials can be downloaded at our website. Thank you very much and good morning. Now that you already have the knowledge set required in relation to our past, let us now go to operations. Our second speaker is Mr. John Rafael Escobar. He's a CAAP licensed remotely piloted aircraft controller and a professional licensed teacher. He is also the manager of Lazarus Information Technology Solutions and Aerial Works. So webinar series of the CAAP RPAS. Um, for this session, we will be talking about the basic operations on remotely piloted aircraft system. So let's begin by first identifying the definition of 
uh, what is a remotely piloted aircraft system or ARPAS in short. So it's defined by a set of configurable elements consisting of a remote, uh, remotely piloted aircraft, its associated uh, remote pilot station, uh, which is required as a command and control link, and um, other system elements, which are classified as payloads. Uh, a very good example of this one are the gimbal cameras, in which at any point during the flight operation, so it's quite a versatile and uh, reconfigurable um, system in which it can actually um, do the job being asked for. So some of the practical applications why it's um, popular in uh, various industries uh, for security, it's used for surveillance, uh, for emergency response. Uh, it, it can be used for search and rescue or for disaster risk management, as well as the delivery or the transport of um, small packages, uh, such as the medications. It can also enable data communication and broadcast of information in remote areas. So uh, nowadays, it's being utilized to um, uh, whenever a cell tower or a communication tower is down, they can quickly deploy um, this RPAS carrying uh, the telecommunication device for trans, uh, for as a transmitter. Now, um, it's also being used as a thermal or a visual uh, inspection of structures and power lines. For construction, it's also being utilized as um, uh, for, for the progress report as well as um, for survey and mapping purposes. So popularly, uh, this is being utilized as uh, for photography, videography, and cin cinematography, and also for agricultural purposes as a chemical sprayer and uh, for uh, fertilizer applications. So more on this, um, recreational users are also um, enticed on uh, availing these um, systems, most especially that you can easily purchase this now due to some uh, big brands that um, distributes them locally. So such, a, such manufacturers like DGI, Autel, and then uh, Swellpro um, give um, commercial, uh, commercial or consumer grade drones that um, somehow fits the lifestyle of um, recreational users. Now, um, the more that we see the accessibility and uh, identify also or explore the, the risk that it might entail on the possible use of uh, RPAS, the more that we give emphasis to its, to its uh, oper operational safety uses. So, whether you're a recreational user or a commercial user, um, the safety of flight is a top priority, most especially for all um, RPAS or RPA controllers. So the responsibilities associated with operating an R RPAS should always be taken seriously. So why do we have to give um, emphasis on this one? because of the risk that it actually brings up. So operating an RPAS would open a particular um, pilot, okay? um, the risk and potential of conse uh, potential consequences of a mid-air collision with another RPA or a manned aircraft. So remember that we are sharing the same airspace with a manned aircraft, so irresponsible use of it might cause accidents or damages as well as um, any loss of control with the, uh, with the RPA might uh, also be um, dangerous, most especially to the people around that, uh, within that perimeter. There is also an intentional misuse, so it can be used for uh, terrorism, okay? especially in uh, bringing uh, packages for illegal transaction. And there are also occupational risk or industrial risk, whether the mission of the RPAS operator involves certain classification of flights. For example, um, the spray, uh, the, the inspection of power lines, okay, for the power lines, 
um, there might be the tendency to damage the tower if uh, if improperly handled, and uh, it might cause uh, a nationwide blackout or a um, community blackout. So, other than the training and certification offered by each manufacturer, we give equal importance to the proper execution of uh, pre-flight planning, aeronautical decision making, and risk management. Okay. So we leave the um, technicalities of uh, every RPAS uh, in respect to their in this, uh, to their particular functions or particular um, skill set needed in order to operate that one. But we focus more on uh, um, safety operations. Okay, so training provided by a manufacturer and certification can only guarantee the controller knowledge for a product itself. It doesn't guarantee that the capability of control controller to comply with safety operational procedures. So this is the purpose of our uh, session for today. So it's a challenge for every aspiring RPA controller to learn uh, pre-flight planning, aeronautical decision making, its importance, as well as risk management as part of their skill set. Remember that um, we are sharing a, a public space and uh, we are also responsible also to not only to our equipment, not only to ourselves, but also to the people, property around us. Okay, so we must be able to share a perspective um, that is common to the aviation field. Okay, so come up, some of the guidelines that uh, are, are established internationally. So this is recognized not only here in the Philippines, but also in other countries. So the RPA is operated first and foremost visual line of sight only. So visual line of sight meaning close enough to see, maintain orientation, achieve accurate flight and tracking. So um, it's important that you be you can you should practice, okay? Practice control, practice your orientation so that you will not be confused on what side you are already flying and how far uh, is or how, or how far or how limited you can uh, control your RPAs. So another one is the height limit of 400 feet and 120 meters. So the reference point to this one is the ground immediately below the RPA. So as you take off, so automatically you're limited up until 400 feet or 120 meters. Well, ex with exception to uh, if you're within the aerodrome. So there are some exemptions to the rule. So if you are authorized by the civil aviation to, to go beyond because the task requires you, you have to secure the permit uh, in order for you to be, to be granted with access to higher altitude. It doesn't mean that uh, your aircraft is capable that you should do it. So we, we must avoid that kind of mentality. Take note that uh, the higher we, we fly our RPAs, there's a tendency that um, it might not, we might not be able to recover it immediately, okay? So we also, uh, for, well, for recreational, unless you're given authority to fly during daytime only, okay? So daytime meaning uh, before, Sunrise and after sunset, you're not allowed, okay? So make sure that you'll be able to see well uh, your RPAs. So the RPA is not operated if there's someone not associated with the flight within 30 meters, okay? So this is common. Someone is amazed uh, trying to ask questions uh, about your RPA. So if they're not uh, related with the operations, you can ask them to mo move as far as um, 30 meters away from, from the area where you are flying, okay? And then the RPA is not operated in a prohibited area or restricted area, most especially in airports for military bases. Um, also, there are uh, areas that are issued um, particular restrictions and this is based on notice to, notices to airmen or NOTAMs. So we must keep ourselves uh, updated with this kind of announcement from the civil aviation websites. Um, RPAs 
are not also allowed to fly over populated areas as you expose yourself to to a more riskier job um there is a tendency that if an rpa fails it might fall over the heads of uh people even the most experienced um con rpa controllers might somehow uh experience some problems and of course um we don't want to really put a lot of people at risk okay and uh you are not allowed to operate an RPA within 10 kilometers of uh, the aerodrome reference point. So the nearest airport, um, so you'll be able to somehow identify it through the map, uh, 10 kilometers around the airport, okay, as a starting point. Okay. So some of the pre-flight practices that uh, uh, we uh, want to share to you is um, in conducting an or prior to conducting a uh, RPA flight or RPA operation, you must have an assessment of the operating environment. So the assessment must include at least of the following. So you have to check the local weather condition, uh, local airspace, any flight restriction within your area. If you're uh, within the city wherein a airport is located, so at least you fly outside the uh, outside the city. Okay. And then um, locations of persons and property on the surface and other ground hazards. So in, it is important to identify any factors that might affect your flight. So as it would also involve them, okay? If, oh well, worse comes to worse. So number two, uh, ensure that all persons directly participating in the RPA operation are informed about the operating con uh, conditions, emergency procedures, contingency procedures, roles and responsibilities of each person involved in operation, and potential hazards. So this is most likely applicable to commercial flyers, um, especially if you're flying within, if you're permitted to fly, uh, let's say for example, you, had a, you have a job on a housing project, and then of course the, those are residential, uh, uh, areas in which um, you also have to orient um, people or visual observers in your company or in the, in the case of recreational users um, or group uh, visual observers to somehow observe uh, these emergency procedures if in case something happens. So it's it's good that um, you would be able to also not to prepare yourself, but also prepare the people around you, um, making sure that um, everyone is aware on um, what to do if in case this happens. Okay? Third, uh, ensure that all RPA components are working properly before takeoff. So any object attached or carried by the RPA is secure and does not adversely affect the flight characteristics or controllability of the aircraft. So let's make use of this as, as, as an example. So for this agricultural drone, um, you, have, may, you have to make sure that the sprayer system would not interfere the propeller or the change in, um, in, pay and in, in weight does not affect the maneuverability of the RPA. So it might be difficult if it might be difficult to maneuver, especially if you start to fill in uh, chemicals uh, to its payload. Okay? So you have to be cautious enough to do some extra or uh, precautionary measures in making sure that you have total control to this kind of aspects. Okay. Next is um, ensure that all necessary documentation is available for inspection, including the RPA controller certificate, aircraft registration, and permits. This is um, required if you are uh, doing uh, RPA services uh, commercially. So for recreational users, as long as you'll be, you have a um, uh, a designated area wherein you have uh, seek permission from a local authority to use 
just make sure that you follow the regulations. I think um, they will no longer ask for this particular document since you're a uh, enthusiast. However, for commercial users, especially those who are uh, flying to riskier locations, um, you should always keep this handy, okay? And uh, lastly, um, I would like to emphasize on this one, the well-being of the RPA controller. Uh, we have to make sure that as an RPA controller, you are in the best possible disposition to control it. Even if you will delegate a visual observer, they must be able to safely carry out their responsibilities to look out for um, your RPA. So prior to flying, there's no uh, consumption of alcoholic beverages or um, not taking in any drug that has adverse effect to the mental and physical capabilities uh, that might affect the flight, of course, okay, or the decision making. And why is that? As uh, RPA controllers, we have this um, thing called aeronautical decision making. So it's a mental process okay, in which pilots use to consistently determine the best course of action in response to a given set of circumstance. So it is what a pilot intends to do based on the latest information he or she has. So for example, you're in the middle of the flight, um, there's a flock of birds that uh, somehow entered the airspace, or for example, a helicopter uh, arrived. So what is the best thing to do? Okay, so by principle, our, our mandate for that one is avoid, uh, detect and avoid. So these things, okay, these attitudes, our openness, our, our uh, recognizing the factors to be able to uh, go towards a more safer okay, decision making. Okay? So in conducting or doing this uh, decision making or making a good judgment, we must we can use of this um, we can use of this uh, framework, okay, which I would summarize into a into a acronym, uh, PAVE. Okay, so the first one, P, uh, pilot in command. Okay, you have to ask yourself if um, are you ready to to control this particular RPA with regards experience? So probably you're used to flying or controlling a small RPA and then you're moving out to a, uh, a bigger RPA than you're used to. So um, the skill set, the, the confidence to fly it. So that's the first thing that you would be able to consider. Second is the aircraft. So is this the right aircraft for the flight? So um, sometimes uh, a particular job would require you to, to fly throughout the, the a small drizzle. So uh, it tends is that, is that it might get wet. So is it um, IP, IP rated or somehow water resistant? Is it or can it handle a strong wind? Okay. So those are the things that um, you would consider the, the structure of the aircraft or the limitations of the aircraft that uh, somehow is, is imposed. Next is the environment, okay? And for the environment, you have the weather, you have the terrain, and then the airspace. So weather is a major environmental consideration. So um, it's suggested that you set your own personal minimums with regards to the weather. So as pilots, okay, or as controllers, uh, you have to evaluate whether the weather for the particular day or the forecasted weather is good for flying, okay, as well as the temperature, as well as the condition, the wind speed, okay. So this would somehow play an important factor in the operation of the RPA, uh, the terrain, okay. Um, it's, a, it's important to also look at the, where you are situated, where you are gonna uh, take off or launch or 
land the particular RPA and also the airspace. If it's a uh, aviary, aviary sanctuary, you have to be, uh, you have to take note of it. Um, the, are there any nearby cell sites or any are there are there nearby uh, airports that you should be considering? So the environment is our third. Okay, and fourth one, uh, external pressures. So sometimes we fly RPAs because of external pressures, because of the intricacy intricacies of the um, RPA, most especially with uh, its capabilities. So we would like to demonstrate our qualification, our capabilities, our features. Sometimes it, get, it gets in the way with uh, aeronautical decision making. Remember that our, as RPA controllers uh, or aspiring RPA controllers, um, the number one priority should always be towards the safety, okay? So, um, apart from this, okay, um, we have the call to proactively identify safety-related hazards and mitigate the associated risk. So, this is the risk management part of uh, the operational safety of our pass. So, um, every, every RPA controllers must follow a good decision-making practice. So, it must be in, uh, inherent to us uh, in such a way that we have the ability to uh, come out with good decision making, good with the way to safety throughout our direct or indirect experience, uh, whether through the seminar or whether through uh, the actual experience. So, as you can see in this process, um, risk management would always start by identifying hazards, assess, assessing the risk, okay, whether it be high or low. Analyze the control, what you can do to, con to somehow avoid, control, or at the same time, um, or minimize, okay? make decisions, use the control suggested, and monitor results if it's effective or not. Then you go, you know, go back to also exploring other hazards. Now, this is very essential, most especially for commercial operators, because it gives you that winning edge to to number one as a professional to to your clients and also as uh, in compliance with the civil aviation authority um, to advocate safety flight for uh, your entire operations i would also suggest that um, in the entire operations okay, safety operations there should be a record keeping practice um, record keeping of flight logs. Um, it would also be helpful to monitor repair and maintenance schedule. And remember that um, our equipments are acts as an investment that we should also protect. So it's not only an, as an investment directly, but an investment indirectly in such a way that we, a uh, good equipment, uh, can somehow uh, ensure the Prop, uh, the, a good performance in accomplishing a task. Okay. Also, it um, we we can usually um, have a sample of this uh, flight logs um, through the, our manufacturers. Sometimes they give out um, manuals in order for us to to follow or to monitor. Also, this would also serve as a documentation as a as a future reference for any reports needed okay so for this one um we we can already conclude on the uh, flight operational safety on rpa with this so we'll be open for questions
I am sorry. We are on mute. <laughs> yes. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I hope you learned a lot from our speakers today. Uh, and uh, I myself, while I was watching their lectures, I, I really learned a lot, especially on the technical side and uh, on the regulations. And uh, should you have any more questions, you may type them in the comment section. And uh, those who are asking about the links uh, for the subsequent parts of this series, uh, I would always uh, repeat this uh, consistently. Please bear with our team. We have a small number of people in our team to do the confirmation as well as the sending of the links and the um, the preparation of this one. So, uh, but uh, rest assured that we will send you uh, your links before each part of the series. And uh, another thing that uh, a lot of people are asking is the certification. Uh, um, we prepared this webinar for uh, information dissemination purposes, and this is really intended uh, for. Uh, to reach as many people as we can. So uh, we, we will not be providing any certifications. So uh, I would like to welcome you again. Uh, our speakers today is uh, Frank Edward Marty, the um, Acting Chief of the Regulatory Standards Department and our OIC in RSDD, or the Regulatory Standards Development Division, and uh, Mr. John Rafael Escobar. Mr. Escobar, I, I really learned a lot from, from him, his um, lecture, and it, he has been, uh, uh, he's an expert in, in this operation, has been conducting it a lot of times. Uh, sir, good morning. Hi, good morning, Irish. Let's hear several from uh, our viewers as well as um, in our social media. So, shall we start? Sure. Uh, our first question, I mean, these are questions, but uh, these are um, just, just the same. Do we need, uh, from Mr. Brian Real and uh, Ron Aldo and uh, Wilbert Osiones, do we need to register the drone if for personal use? Or for hobby? Um, okay, sir. Allow me to answer that, Irish. Um, as a general rule, for drones that are aircraft that, that are used for purposes of uh, personal consumption that is not a commercial in nature, then as a rule, you don't have you do not have to register the drone. But there are exceptions to such rule. However, um, Say, for example, a drone you, that you're going to use weighs more than 7 kilograms. As I mentioned in my presentation, it has to be registered. Also, when you operate during nighttime, you have to secure a special appearance to operate uh, for that specific drone. So, as a rule, you, did not, uh, you, you, do, not, you do not need to, to yes. register. However, uh, I, I also mentioned this in my presentation that um, as part of a responsible drone owner, uh, a practice of a being a responsible drone owner, one has to register the drone regardless of whether the drone will be used for personal consumption or for uh, commercial pur purposes. Uh, it would be good for, the, for a drone owner to have its unit registered with the CDA. Um, sir, as a practitioner, do you have um, something to add or... Um, as a practitioner, uh, is it necessary to to register your drone? I think for liability purposes, um, recreational drone users must also must register in the future, um, given that we must be able to track down, to trace if in case an RPAS is lost. Um, but it doesn't mean that um, you won't observe any flight uh, or operational safety, as I have mentioned, that if you're using your RPAS in, uh, recreationally, you will have to observe particular um, rules that are under them. For example, you, you are going to fly it only in open areas, in secured areas, in such a way that um, there's still a controlled environment where you can um, safely, safely enjoy your hobby. So those are some of the implications that 
Um, even though it's not registered, you must observe as a hobbyist. Okay. Um, another follow-up question. Uh, sa ibang bansa ba may licensing? Parang walang, wala naman ata. Mm. Well, actually, um, drones in other countries are also registered. There are countries that requires registration of drones for a specific time, but not all drones. But there are other countries also that do not require registration. But what matters the most here is uh, the registration or licensing uh, procedures and processes here in our country before one can operate the drone. Thank you. Uh, and then we will proceed. Uh, I have here a question. When you say populated area, what is the maximum number that uh, maximum number of people that should be in the place? Do you have a specific count? If uh, they say three is a, three is a crowd, so uh, would three people be considered as, as a populated space area? There is actually no hard and fast rule in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations or there is no definition when it comes to a populated area or a populous area. But um, the intention really of uh, this regulation when we say populous area, it um, denotes a place wherein a crowd is there, such as a marketplace, school, or um, at, uh, an event where there are a lot of people, or or even in streets, those are considered populous area. For us in general, um, any public space, we consider it as populated areas, whether we're flying uh, above the streets or um, in commercial establishments. So we observe necessary uh, protocols and uh, measures in order to make sure that um, when we when we were given permission to operate in, the, in those areas, we also inform them or on what are the things that we should remember if in case something happens. Um, you previously mentioned on uh, operating on the streets. What if the street is empty? Or maybe uh, early in the morning, like 6 a.m., where there's still no, no, no people around. Mm -hmm. Regardless uh, whether the streets are empty or populated, I think you must be able to establish it because you cannot control whether a person may suddenly appear on the streets or suddenly uh, there will be some bystanders who will be coming out to see or uh, a commotion that will be happening there. So as a second observe here, we are really into the more of safety. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, from from our discussion today, I haven't heard something that is um, uh, if something is something already happened. I, I I haven't heard a a second uh, or an emergency response. But uh, I I think it, it is really good to to be to be careful and uh, to to take safety precautions first. Yes, yes. Uh, that is why our regulations were established in order to promote safety and, of course, this, well, safety for the people, for the for public safety. And then I think this is a very good thing to take precaution. Another uh, question from Weblink TV. What will happen if we try to fly the drone even in a restricted area with all agreement and acceptance of all liabilities to, to fly the drone? Do we have a penalty? Technically, yes, because um, number one, it's not you're uh, you're not only coordinating with uh, with the civil aviation, but there are also other um, other agencies that are that would impose such such restrictions, and you, you as a person or as an operator cannot guarantee the safety, even though that you are capable of, um, let's say bearing all the responsibilities, bearing all the liabilities, still um, proper coordination or proper or, or communication channels must be well established. Otherwise, there is a bypass of authority. Um, we have here a question from uh, PG Gab, or one of our 
um, viewers here. Um, FPV drones operate with FPV goggles. Do they qualify as not flying line of sight? My first question is, what is a F? What is an FPV drone? So FPV drones are first-person view. Stands for a first-person view. Usually, um, this is utilized by uh, racing drone uh, pilots, in which they control high speed. Um, High speed uh, quadcopters to compete. Now, um, there's a prerequisite in op operating this. Um, for example, in international organizations which organize this FPV racing, uh, racing um, competition, they would require visual observers to be set up. So, let's say uh, I'm a recreational um, drone uh, user and I'm a, I would like to fly my FPV drone and I'm impaired by my um, or my capability of uh, look, looking at the operation of the quadcopter to line of sight, I would I would uh, ask ask help for a uh, uh, visual observer or any any other any other team members usually FPV drone rate. So this is to just ensure that you're still flying within the bounds or the perimeter of the area. And you have to make sure that there are no other people that can be um, um, that can be affected by the impairment. So I think that's a requisite. Yeah. There are also limitations um, for drone competitions or for activities involving drone competition or our past mm -hmm. competition, there are a set uh, of guidelines provided in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations as to uh, the distance, as to uh, uh, the height that one can operate. So um, those are all provided in the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations. Uh, for those who are curious about the Philippine Civil Aviation Regulations or the PICAR, uh, we have copies of our PICAR. Uh, at the CAAP website, you may visit our website at www.caap.gov.ph and you can download the, the, those provisions. Uh, it's in part 11, part 2 for, for personal licensing and uh, part 4. Um, so to continue with the questions, uh, we have here from... I bought a drone from other country and would like to bring it in the Philippines. Should I need to inform CAP first and have it registered? We we were we are receiving a lot of um, uh, telephone questions about this, especially um, for those um, coming from abroad, um, sir. Well, well uh, if one is like bringing a drone here in the Philippines as a rule, you do not have to register immediately, or you do not have to secure a. Uh, a certificate from CAAP that you will be importing a, or you will be bringing a drone with you uh, on your transit. However, of course, when you enter the Philippine um, territory, uh, you have to secure, you have, to have that customs clearance or ensure that uh, taxes and uh, duties are paid for that items that are you are that, that you are going to uh, bring with you. Also, um, if the quantity of the drone that you're bringing is uh, for commercial, uh, for business purposes, then of course you have to uh, pay the necessary taxes and duties for that. Sir, what, what about, uh, do you have um, any, any experiences with uh, uh, For this other one? countries, if you're, especially if you're traveling, you're going to visit um, other countries. They would require uh, a temporary license for that one, a temporary license for the drone, so that they can they can operate in their airspace. But uh, for now, um, I think if you're traveling from the from other countries going to uh, Manila or here, any part of the Philippines, you are not allowed. Uh, you are not required to to register your drone, not unless you're gonna operate it for commercial purposes. In, in in our case, we have some international clients that just uh, hire our services because we are already registered here. So, um, but 
when it comes to their equipment being um, being utilized here commercially, I think it ma it will undergo re uh, registration also here in the country. I think what is important here is that when you bring your drone coming from abroad, uh, one has to observe the rules and regulations when it comes to the operations. Uh, the permit, well, uh, it is not necessary, but knowing the limitations and uh, restrictions of uh, the operation. Those are the things that one should consider, I mean, one should know before um, operating here. Which leads me to another question. Uh, would I would like to bring my drone in the Philippines, but I heard that the drone will be held at customs unless we provide a certification from CAAP. If yes, uh, what would I need to get from CAAP? So uh, these are drones that are confiscated or that are held in customs. Do we have any, uh, a regulation on that? Um, actually, we do not uh, issue such certification, but depending on the nature of the drone, mm -hmm. say for example, the drone is uh, intended basically for uh, photography during vacation, then of course uh, it is something that is not uh, that is not prohibited. But say for example, uh, the use of the drone, you can you, you can see the from from, from uh, the very drone itself, it is uh, has this uh, what do you call this? Uh, the, the use of such drone will something be a uh, violative of whatever regulations that we do have. Then of course uh, it has a, a certain restrictions. The authorities may uh, hold the drone. Um, I think it was a policy before. Um, that's why uh, a lot of people are really um, trying to clarify this one. Um, mostly, um, the, the, this is being raised only when you are trying to import import uh, for commercial selling. Okay? But with regards the use, you're a traveler, you just going to transfer or uh, bring it to the Philippines. Um, I think customs will not. Uh, will not question it, not unless that you're bringing in a lot of drones, which yeah. is which you can, you can be questioned. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like you're already importing it for um, importing it for selling here locally. So not that those those stuff can be um, um, questioned by customs. But uh, just to add to that, the authority, I mean the CAAP right now, is um, uh, reaching. Uh, uh, coordinating as well with uh, the Bureau of Customs when it comes to these matters. So uh, hopefully in the near, in the very near future, we can address these concerns so that we will not be ha we will not be having these issues again and we will not be encountering these concerns again. Yes. We we have been us in RSD. We have been collaborating and coordinating yeah. with other um, law enforcement agencies as well as local governments and other agencies in the government. And uh, there is so much potential in this drone industry, mm -hmm. and there is so much to develop in this uh, regulations. And uh, in the coming, there we we have something in the pipeline. So we have. Uh, so another question is: uh, My drone has a no return to home feature. Would it still be okay to use it for commercial purposes? Uh, do you have any specifications on what drones may be registered for commercial? I think this has been answered, but uh, the return the return to home feature. Well, what is this return to home feature? Actually, it's a fail-safe feature. So um, if in case something happens, somehow at the direct conning function, um, your drone will be able to go back to its um, take-off point. Okay. So it's a Safety feature that at least by the minimum must an uh, RPAS an uh, RPAS must possess. So I think um, if you're especially if you're operating commercially, okay, you also want to retrieve your RPAS as oh, so yes. an investment. So yes. I suggest that you to using the draw at um, the return to home function. Okay. Um, I think we have last two questions um, from. R.D. Perez for uh, Mr. Escobar. Are all the different kinds of commercial operations you showed in your slide being done here in the Philippines already, such as agricultural spraying and etc.? 
For agricultural, yes, we're uh, currently doing it. There are some companies, uh, I won't mention those operators, uh, registered not only with CAAP but also with uh, Civil Aeronautical Board because they're required um, for um, uh, for power um, for electric uh, companies. Yes, they're currently doing it right now. Recently, I think um, a particular government agency has announced the purchase of um, this particular number of drones for the 